Right, good morning, uh, good afternoon everyone. This is uh, Paul de Cruz here. So thank you for joining us for the Security Threats and Predictions uh, webinar today. Uh, so I've got a number of uh, colleagues that are going to be assisting me uh, today on this session. So I've got Sean from our Threat Research uh, Cloud Security team. So he'll be going through a bit more depth around some of the, the threats that we're seeing and the research we're doing around that. Uh, we've also got Hazim and Fernando who are part of the consulting team that will be helping uh, with the Q&A as well. So uh, again, please feel free to ask some questions as we go through. We've got the Q&A panel for that uh, and both myself and Sean will also be helping with that. If there's any outstanding questions as we go through towards the end of the session, uh, we've got some time for Q&A uh, at the end as well. You will be sent the recording. Uh, so you will get the slides and the recording and we're going to have further information links that you can use to, to both look at some of the trends that we're talking about here but also ways that you can potentially uh, protect yourself uh, against some of the challenges uh, that, that we're going to talk about today. So next slide please Sean. So we'll be talking around a few trends that we're seeing here. So, so firstly uh, Cisco publish a cyber security report every year. This may be something that, that you are aware of already or not, but we will provide a link at the end of this session so you can actually download this report. So we've been doing this for a few years now. We, we look at the, the trends that we're seeing. So we see a lot of information uh, from an internet perspective, enterprise service provider perspective. And we take that threat intelligence to actually provide uh, guidance to our customers in different markets uh, around that threat intelligence. and. Part of that has been used for today's session, but as we're going into 2019, uh, I'll be discussing uh, with the team a bit further around what we're seeing beyond uh, the security report that was published uh, a little while ago, early on this year. So these are the kind of key trends that, that we see as important uh, as Cisco. These aren't the only ones that, that are out there. Um, I'm sure many of you are reading more widely uh, around what, what you're seeing in your marketplace, but these are ones that we're, we're seeing as key ones that were either started uh, occurring in 2018 or will definitely continue or appear more in, in 2019. So, so firstly, if we uh, go to the next slide, please, Sean. So firstly, if we start looking at the, the rise of encrypted uh, internet and enterprise traffic, so the internet going dark, so essentially what we're talking about here, more and more traffic is encrypted. So realistically around looking at the, the amount of web traffic today that's encrypted, if we look back in 2017, that was around 50%. As we've gone through uh, 2018, we've already hit nearly 75% of web traffic. And Gartner is already saying that around 80% of enterprise traffic will be encrypted uh, as we head into 2019 as well. So what that means is uh, effectively we're reducing the visibility that, that may have existed previously with a lot of the security mechanisms and tools that, that were out there today in traditional infrastructures. So most enterprises are therefore turning to machine learning and artificial intelligence to address this. So with these capabilities, you know, really you can spot unusual patterns in large volumes of encrypted web traffic. And really this helps you then to investigate further. So in one respect, encryption is meant to enhance security, but it also can provide malicious actors more powerful tools to conceal things like command and control activity uh, to inflict damage as well. So from a Cisco perspective, we're really looking at this in different parts. We're looking at this around encrypted threat analytics, both at you know, hardwood, hardware and network infrastructure perspective, but also look at, looking at it from a cloud end user perspective as well. And we're also looking at ways that we can make decisions much earlier in the cycle. So even if it's an encrypted connection, can we make a decision about the website or the domain? Is that malicious that the end user is going to? Can we block that before uh, an actual traffic or data transaction happens between the end user and those sites? So there's a number of things that we can still do, even though uh, the actual data uh, or the connection is more encrypted moving forward. The second trend really that we're talking about here is the Internet of Things. So again, this is a massive area of growth, both in uh, a consumer marketplace, so the home, as well as in the wider, the wider kind of enterprise and professional uh, verticals. So really the technology has been increased, uh, increasingly deployed by organizations, but minimal thought sometimes is around the security risk and potential consequences. Uh, we see that there's a lot of legacy IoT infrastructure that's out there. 
uh, and we also see a lot of new infrastructure appearing. Um, you know, some of these IT, IoT deployments are well away from the main uh, network areas. They potentially slipped under the radar. But IoT will continue to be deployed and continue to be a greater threat landscape. So, you know, cyber criminals may go beyond mere attacks and use target victims as a gateway to install ransomware onto minimal uh, protected devices and then bounce off those into other organizations. We've seen quite a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of attacks this year that have uh, been based on that and we'll see uh, more of those as we go into, into next year. So it's kind of the kind of key industries where there's a strong uptake of IoT, uh, include consumer, healthcare, transportation, manufacturing and energy. Uh, but one common uh, aspect of this is there's not a common uh, policy protocol and approach across all of these types of devices. So we need to start looking at how we can layer a security uh, across IoT in a, in a different way. So really the fight back there, we start looking at that, you know, what things can we do? Uh, we start looking at, you know, what are the type of vulnerabilities that are out there? Uh, we plan how we protect uh, devices that may already be existing in infrastructures as well as looking at how uh, we can uh, leverage security for the new, uh, new infrastructures that are going out as well. But also we need to think about how can we protect those devices so instead of just focusing on the protection layers within the device itself, actually look at how we can protect those devices from going to malicious sites and domains and infrastructure in the first place. How can we stop that actual first point of connection? Then we move into to cloud. So, you know, cloud both as a use case for providing services but uh, also uh, a use case for actually uh, the security within the cloud itself. So from, from a cloud perspective, you know, I've called it, you know, cloud insecurity, but really what we're talking about there is how can we make cloud uh, as secure, more secure than, than the private infrastructures, the on-premise infrastructures that we've got today. So, you know, we should consider the fact that we're using a service that we're actually passing or handing off the importance or reliance of, of uh, security into those providers. It's very much down to us to ensure that, that we've got that continuity uh, around security policy and control. So really, from, from that perspective, what we're looking at is to ensure consistent security across both physical on-premise and also in the cloud infrastructure, uh, making sure that the providers are accountable uh, and uh, in line with our expectations in that area. And we've seen measures being brought in across public cloud infrastructure to ensure that compliance is there, avoid data leakage, have control of your data and really start looking at things like building a baseline around how the services work, so uh, ensure that we know what good behavior is and then also what bad behavior is. And then artificial intelligence and machine learning and those kind of aspects are things that can be used to dynamically look at that. And they're the investment areas that, that Cisco is certainly making to take away the manual nature of setting up some of these tool sets within the cloud as well as uh, within the on-prem. And we'll touch on that as we go through. So these are really important uh, trends that we're seeing that we're investing uh, a lot of time and attention in Cisco to, to think about how we can support you uh, in addressing these trends. So next slide, please, Shane. So the other aspect is if you think about the user behavior piece as well, you know, security should support what you and I and the, the wider population are trying to do uh, in our jobs, our daily life. So it shouldn't be a hindrance. So if we look at the kind of trendings around how we're using data, how we're using service, how we're using devices, that's very much changing. The fact of uh, where in the enterprise people used to have a fixed uh, you know, place of work, a standard kind of working practice, that's pretty much out the window now in most industries. So we're seeing really an increase on the number of devices that are out there and, and things. Uh, so that when we say things, we mean things from a perspective of different internet or IP connected devices, right? And going back to the IoT example, some of these may have different levels of security, capability, and viability in what they, what they are. But, you know, the massive explosion has been around smart devices as a great example on that, more in the home devices as well. So we need to think about how can we make security more easy to use at that device level as well. And also the, the concepts around, you know, thinking about that end user. You know, do we trust an end user or a device, whether it's already within uh, what we what we deem as the professional or business environment or outside that on, on the wild west of the internet. We're starting to see more of these models now around zero trust where we think about, you know, 
we don't trust the device, whether it's in or outside our infrastructure. We have to kind of do the same sort of checks on, on these on these devices or, or things coming in to the environment. So the other aspect is is really from a network campus and branch perspective, the differences that we're seeing there is is more usage of SaaS-based services, so software as a service models, uh, applications in the cloud. So we're seeing a real hybrid uh, approach to that. Some applications sitting within the environment, so maybe database systems and so forth, which uh, are harder and slower to change, versus more rapid, uh, you know, application sharing, file sharing, uh, collaboration type tools that are very much already orientated to SaaS-like models that are out there today that are being used. So that changes the dynamics of where does the traffic flow uh, from the user? Maybe if the device is on-premise within within the, the actual uh, professional environment or whether it's off-premise when people are traveling or working out of different locations as well. But we've definitely seen an up and we'll continue to see an up on the number of devices connecting, the types of OSs and so forth, and the number of SaaS-based services that are out there. So really from a threat perspective, we need to start thinking about you know, how can we help users use these services securely, not particularly block them uh, from using them completely because they will find ways around those types of uh, approaches with security, but work hand in hand to protect them when they're using these services uh, within the cloud. So next slide, please. So from a perspective of um, looking at additional security trends, um, so one thing that what we've seen a, a big spike on is uh, crypto mining, crypto jacking. And really this is where we start using professional infrastructure, business infrastructures uh, for cryptocurrency uh, you know, mining. And this has been a big spike. So from a perspective of 2018 moving into 2019, we've seen uh, you know, malicious use cases in this area because there's less coordinated uh, law enforcement uh, around this particular area. And that means that there's been a higher, you know, utilization in this area. And I'll come on to, to looking at some of these trends. But the reason we're able to pick up this data is because we see a high percentage of traffic from an Internet perspective. We're typically seeing around, uh, you know, 4 to 5% of all Internet uh, traffic going through uh, the Cisco uh, estate from our customers, uh, protecting our customers. Uh, you know, we're seeing around 175 billion DNS uh, resolutions a day that we're supporting our customers. So this means that we've got a lot of information we can use to start understanding what, what trends are, are out there. So the Cryptus jacking one is a, is a massive one that's on the rise. And if we just go to the next slide, please. And from, from a perspective of that, what's really interesting, and, and it's not just information that we've we found ourselves from real research and data points, but we're seeing also that there was a real lacklustre view on this where a lot of people were under-reporting, uh, you know, crypto jacking, crypto mining as, as, a, as an issue, when actually now we're seeing that that's, that's you know, taken off and, and increasing as we go into 2019. And we've already seen, you know, certainly a number of uh, different, different cases uh, advertised out there around, uh, around this. Um, move on to the next one, please. So if you kind of look at the data points that we're getting here around that, so uh, from a, a crypto market, the actual crypto market has risen massively. You know, we can see here, so $835 billion, uh, still very much mainstream. Uh, it's a prime target. And I've talked around that sort of decentralization of, uh, of government enforcement. And this is some of the challenges we see, both good and bad, with, with the Internet. Right? You, you, you have to kind of think about how can we do centralized law enforcement? How can we actually clap down on these, these bad actors if they're distributed across the infrastructure? Again, and that's where the power of, of some of the intelligence that we've got comes in because we can see some of these infrastructures being, being set up and from a malicious point of view, and then we can start blocking and reporting on that. And Sean will talk about that. Next slide, please. So just giving, again, some, some more ideas of this. So we start comparing uh, crypto mining against phishing and those kind of aspects. Because there's been a bit more clamping down on phishing and, and other tool sets that typically sit within the enterprise, we've seen you know, a subtle decline on that particular area, but we've seen a massive increase on, on crypto mining. Uh, and if we go on to the next slide as well, we can start looking at some of the industry breakdowns that we've got around uh, those points as well. 
So if you look here, so the, the really interesting thing around this is if you start going back to that IoT use case when we start talking about how are infrastructures uh, misused uh, from a perspective of the number of devices that are out there, the fact that the security layers that they may or may not have. If you look at what we're finding from a, an industry breakdown of what we're seeing from our data around uh, crypto mining and crypto jacking is you can see a massive increase of this in energy and utility as an example against maybe some of the other industries that are out there that may have, have newer infrastructures in place, uh, more capable security uh, in place. But you know, you can see a, a very high volume in utilities uh, as an example. So we're doing a lot of work uh, with both government and national critical infrastructures and these kind of utility industries to, to help address this and help them understand how they can start blocking against this. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So next slide, please. So I've talked about some of the trends there. So there were around five different ones that we we're, were focusing on there. Again, that's not a complete list. There's many more, but these are ones that we see as quite critical to, to do further research, development, and support to help you uh, address those as we go into 2019. What Sean's going to do now is go down a little bit more into uh, the threat uh, research intelligence side, how what we're actually seeing on the ground, give you some examples of that, and some of the tool sets that we've got to, to help look at that as well. Hey guys, so I'm just going to get my screen back and just going to start presenting again. Good morning everybody. Uh, there we go. So we're going to speak about the trends, the predictions that we've frequently seen so far uh, in the stress research community with the customers and with the wider audience of the internet today. So I'm just going to have handpicked uh, quite a few from here and uh, we're going to speak about that which could be a big problem in 2019 and how we handle this at Umbrella and Cisco to solve these. Okay, the police study sequel to debut in Asia soon. So uh, phishing uh, is, is, is everywhere. I mean, uh, you get an email, you click on something and you get fish. So that was pretty, it's a common pattern for any cloud-based service like Office 365, your Hotmail or Gmail. But these guys have actually taken it to a new level. So this was one from the Iceland government where uh, people started receiving phishing mails uh, with uh, the email that says, hi there, you've been asked to come for an inquiry or a questioning. Please click here and enter a bunch of details. So probably when you click this, these are the possible things that might happen. Once a keylogger can get downloaded, Trojans can get downloaded and e-wallet scrubber can happen so that can sniff on you. The point actually remains here if you could just see my mouse pointer moving around. Uh, these can be homograph attacks which I would explain in the coming slides that look looks totally legit. It's got a HTTP certificate and it looks really, 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 really legit and then you click on it. Uh, why I would say this debut in Asia soon is because the awareness of cyber loss and uh, cyber crimes have been growing in Asia and we had a lot of uh, income tax spams that was just kicking in. I had an opportunity to investigate a couple of them saying that you've not filed your returns. Click here and those were emoted Trojans that stole your banking credits. So this is a big thing that will definitely debut in Asia next year. And all these that you see are actually uh, refined scarewares. A scareware is something that says click here to clean your computer, your computer is infected. So I mean, people are aware of those scareware things, which is God saying that Microsoft is outdated, updated. But this is a refined scareware is what I observed. And then we, we've dug much into that and we figured out that it actually looks kind of a legit email, but it's a scareware, but it, it, does, it does a bunch of keyloggers, Trojans, and wallet grabbing, so which eventually is the hybrid malware. Okay, the malware subtitle files. So back in the day, uh, what happened was uh, the Microsoft uh, guys found out something like the all the Microsoft documents are like RTF files. A text document and RTF file is actually a subtitle file. Everybody watches movies here, and a subtitle file is nothing but an RTF extension that says at which minute and what minute what dialogue actually plays, and that's in plain text format. So uh, the earlier malware that actually came was there were a lot of VLC players and popcorn time players and uh, other online players were having this vulnerability where when you actually 
open or upload the subtitle files, you would the attackers actually would gain a backdoor to your system. So that was that was because of outdated versions of VLC and other players like popcorn times, online players. So that was actually fixed. But what we are seeing today is is a trend. Now everybody watches Game of Thrones, everybody watches House of Cards, everybody watches John Wick, anything that's trending in Twitter, say an episode's leaked, you'd probably first Google, people would Google first and see for that episode that's leaked online. So when they get hold of these third-party players, they started watching it. And since you really want to get into the hang of things and understand the series or a movie, you would need a subtitle. So using Google bombing, what the attackers would do is they would put their malicious subtitle files by just manipulating the page ranking by adding a lot of URLs so that your, you know, your website comes first five pages of when you surf google.com. So uh, what attackers do is they upload these malicious files. In this case, this is going to be a trend. Prime target might be Asia again because there are a lot of people uh, have a different browsing pattern here where they would, you know, not buy or watch Netflix or uh, other legit players most of the times they would just use these type of uh, free players. So in this case, the player is not the vulnerability. The malware subtitle file that you download itself is malicious. So that will be a hybrid malware again. It can actually steal your banking credits or drop a keylogger or act as a bot too. So this is the second trend we were seeing and I uh, have a couple of uh, samples also in my uh, computer where uh, there were obfuscated scripts that uh, these RTF files contained. And it's even worse because we have computers that are not at times updated to the latest version of Windows. And if your RTF extension is outdated too, you might get compromised. So that's the other trend that we're seeing. So uh, I'm going to talk more of homograph phishing and uh, Windows 10 service update with the demo and, and so that we can, we can figure it out uh, more. So what I'm going to do is just quickly show you something. Uh, in Investigate that I have. So there we go. So this is the Investigate uh, Cisco Umbrellas uh, Investigate tool that we use to look at the good, bad, and the ugly domains. And uh, so I'm going to paste a URL for you guys in this case where this is really, really interesting. So what am I showing you here is this actually looks like a legit, really legit domain. So this is actually a Chinese domain that I can allow anybody to register a domain in any language because of the Punicode format. So what this appears to be is a legit Chinese domain that uses Cyrillian characters to make it look exactly like a good domain. But watch the magic. Well, this is exactly not the domain that we typed. So this is looks a very, very different domain. Apparently what happens with these uh, homograph attacks is you can register a domain with Cyrillian characters X, N using the Unicode to Punicode format where this, when, you know, entered or registered would exactly look like this, the domain that I typed earlier. So what happens in this case is, so I exactly typed that and we had a domain that was just transforming. So this was the domain I typed, but what you eventually saw was different. So the culprit can be browsers too. What happens in this case is, if I look at the SSL certificate of this, it still is registered by the website name, and it's still not giving you the name that it was actually talking about this. So this type of attacks are like homograph attacks, so this is how homograph attack works. Now, if I go back to the slide, it will make a lot of sense again for you why I showed you this. What happens with homograph attacks is, uh, like an example that I showed you earlier, an attacker would register a domain that looks like exactly a Windows 10 domain with the homograph characters and Cyrillian characters. They would drop something called as a service update for Windows.exe, which is a hybrid malware. It can be a coin miner, somebody was actually talking about, like Paul was talking about the crypto mining things. It can be a Trojan or a keylogger too. So it really looks like a legit domain, like a windows.com, but when you click and you update and you check, it still looks like this. 
but we in Umbrella kind of dig, I'll just speak about that and then we would find out if it's a legit domain or not. Uh, Windows 10 would be a really, really major target uh, in 2019 uh, because of these two things, uh, data execution prevention and structured exception handling protection. Uh, malware generally use a concept where they latch themselves to a legit process. For example, when you have a node pair, it ha ha has a bunch of DLLs and a malware would spin a legit process that opens with a notepad or a Microsoft Word document and hollows out the memory. So that's called as a hollow process injection so that it can save the legit memory off the new process and inject itself. So with the protected process, you cannot do that, that only a set of processes or a bunch of DLLs are allowed to do it. And uh, the custom exception handling is also really protected. So malware authors will definitely explore this space to see that, so in this case, one process cannot access another process's memory or details. They'll definitely, definitely gonna tramper it because uh, the traditional malwares or the age-old malwares have been working based, heavily based on these three things. And I think that's something gonna be really tampered uh, with Windows 10. So we also sandboxing and um, analyzing those malwares in 10, which works a little different when we analyze. So this would be a really, really big step uh, uh, and a major target in the next years. Well, I explained to you about the homograph attack. So you see that this domain and this domain. So in Umbrella, we would go and block the domain once we figured out what the homograph domain is. And uh, I think Paul's gonna say, explain about uh, how we're gonna block it and, and how Umbrella is gonna work. So uh, that's, so we also tackle this uh, obfuscated credit card stealers in Mage. So Mage is an application, Mage Cart where you can just have a snap of a finger or a couple of snaps and you can bring up a shopping cart site. And uh, we have a bunch of internal classifiers and intelligence that helps you to catch these kind of obfuscated credit card stealing scripts. So this has been uh, a big nuisance for the last two and a half years and we've been stopping that too. So this is still gonna be bigger because the online shopping mode and e-commerce business is booming and, and it's going big and uh, this type of threat still persists. What happens is, if there's a legit site, the site's actually compromised and there's no malware uh, inserted. Instead, they put these type of obfuscated scripts and would steal from the checkout option in a credit card cart and they would steal your details. That's because of the vulnerability in Mage if you have not updated it. And these type of Java scripts so basically the malware will not be there. So when you just access the page, it's gonna redirect and drop uh, the bunch of uh, malwares when you run. So this I just saw 35 minutes back to be honest. So one of the colleagues here actually sent an email. Uh, so this is gonna be something big is what I felt. It's just a big spark for me because Yahoo, Hotmail are not predominantly used today. And if you have a toolbar install, this is definitely called as a spear phishing. So it's gonna send that, this is not your user ID and it's asking for a key and it redirects to you to a bunch of malicious uh, sites. So be careful when we install these free printer, free converters, they would come with the Yahoo toolbar. Those toolbars are getting tampered. And this is the first that we're seeing in Asia today, just 35 minutes back and it was just able to decode into a bunch of uh, things. Uh, quick thing before I close out on my, I just wanna show you one more thing. So how do we stop these things at research? So what do we do is, we have our intelligence at times, what we do is we use this like, if we have attacking bad domains like a phishing or an exploit kit, we monitor these <clears throat> DNS query spikes. If it's of the same pattern and sharp pattern, the moment next time a domain comes like this and if the pattern matches, we classify it as a malware or a phishing immediately without a doubt. So, uh, that's how we kind of uh, stop these. We have automated methods. Our intelligence works really strong in such cases. And, and we would we, we predominantly stiff, sniff these things even before the attack happens. A full grown attack ha happens and we stop that uh, before the campaign even spreads or uh, haywire or wild. Uh, so we're building better systems to tackle these uh, phishing, spear phishing, homograph phishing. We have a browsing pattern data so we would be talking about that X factors that we are using, that system that's being built. 
based on the patterns in 2019, our product remote map is going to have that. We're still in testing progresses. Uh, testing is in progress, and it's a big progress that's going to uh, go on, and we're working on it. So we're testing a lot of geographical location-based attacks to see how the browsing pattern is and block these attacks even before it occurs. So that's what we are, we are currently working uh, on. So I'm going to hand over it to Paul again for the next set of trends. Thanks, Paul. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Sean. And I think it was good just to see a bit more around what we're doing in the background at, at more depth than even you know half an hour ago some of the new things that you're seeing there, Sean, in threat research and, and sharing that back with the customers. And just a point to note, you know, the, the threat research organization, Cisco, is over 300 people strong. Uh, we've got uh, different threat researchers from different parts of the business working together uh, on, on these platforms. So, you know, it's an important part of our, our business uh, as part of what we call the Talos group, uh, if you haven't heard of that before. Um, so, I mean, important thing there is, you know, malware, phishing, et cetera, isn't going to go away. I know we were talking about the trends earlier, but we're, we're talking about making sure you've got basic cyber hygiene in place uh, to address these, these kind of challenges. And, and the intelligence that we were just talking to there shows you about how we're looking at the, the, the Internet infrastructure to help build on that and, uh, you know, block against the, these threats. So, you know, ransomware, crypto mining, banking trojan, the VPN filters, these are all things that, we will continue to sort of see grow and change and, and threaten uh, both business and consumer in 2019. Uh, so it's an important place to still uh, focus the time and attention. So next slide, please. So if we're, we're talking about uh, the fact that we've, we, we've got predictions around where, where we're seeing security threat in the cyber domain, we talked a bit about the research that we're, we're doing and, and how we're using that and what we're seeing. Uh, this is the part where we're talking about how can we address some of those things. You know, what proactive measures can we do with you as our customers and partners to, to, to help address some of these challenges? So if we kind of look at the four, the four uh, points that we were discussing earlier on. Uh, so the Internet of Everything, you know, devices are going to want to connect to networks. They're going to want to connect to the Internet more, more, more openly day by day. The, the, the fact of having a closed... Um, dedicated infrastructure that's going away. There's there's plenty of examples of where you know uh, devices have have broken out of the typical walled garden approach in say retail, where you know alarm systems are connected outside the organisation or uh, consumer information systems are connected into other secure systems. So you know things are going to connect to the internet as a, as a point uh, you know outside the organisation. So we need to think about how can we protect those devices? How can we can stop those devices? of whatever type from getting to malicious sites. And really, this is where we start thinking about building on, on what we call Umbrella as a platform. So what, what Sean was talking to there, the threat intelligence there and so forth, that's all built around what we call Umbrella uh, as a cloud-delivered security solution. So really what we're doing is we're, we're learning, first of all, we're looking at the intelligence uh, to look at what types of attack potentially exist out there, how we can be predictive against what attacks will be coming next from what infrastructures. So we're looking at that. We're giving the visibility of that uh, type of infrastructure also to you as a customer. So uh, the umbrella investigate tool set that you saw at the end there is something that you can use to actually do further proactive investigation around the threats. You know, are they, are they targeted against your organization directly? Are they geographically based or are they global based? You know, that kind of intelligence we can build up from, from what we know about uh, the Internet. And, and more importantly is we can block. We can be predictive and we can block. Uh, based on either uh, the threats that we're seeing there or based on the policies that you're putting out there about what users can go to or not go to in regards to site access. You know, can they, can they access um, certain applications like social media applications or not? You know, can, they, can they access uh, gambling sites or not? You know, these are the kind of things that you know, we can stop putting policies around. So the Internet is going dark. You think about more and more data being encrypted, that pushes us down the front end of actually saying, Let's look at the sites themselves. Let's look at where people are going to to understand if that's malicious or not, to, to make the decision and take that decision away from actually doing it later in the game when it's further down the line. It doesn't mean that we can't block or stop uh, from malicious uh, activity uh, after the event. So if a device has been compromised, maybe it's been taken outside the wall garden of an enterprise or private environment, maybe it's got malware and so forth on it. 
we can still block the C2 callback, the command and control callback out to these malicious sites. So we can still address the fact that more and more is going dark. The cloud adoption, again, is a phased approach. We think about what kind of things we're trying to protect against. So the sort of things that we can do is, uh, you know, prevent people from from sharing passwords between different sites and opening up access and information. So a good example is you go into a hotspot area, you want to use someone's Wi-Fi, it says, hey, why don't you just log on by using your credentials from another uh, SaaS-based service? And then behind the scenes, you're actually showing, you're sharing a lot of data and information, personal information and so forth. So again, we can put in tools there, like cloud access um, uh, brokerage tools, so we can actually work with the APIs with those SaaS tools to stop users from doing that to actually monitor the behavior of the users using these uh, solutions. We can stop data leakage around people actually posting confidential data outside the organization as well. So these are the types of things we can put those barriers in place to stop people from uh, going outside compliancy or even look at the compliancy of the organization so to make sure that, that, that you know, the users and the, the business are, are compliant to that. The other aspect is if you're thinking about using more cloud-like solutions like Amazon, like Google, like um, as your as a capability, that means you're using someone else's uh, compute or server in the cloud. So we've got to start thinking about the controls around that. So again, we're looking for compliance adherence and, and how can you uh, protect against that. So we've got a platform called Stealthwatch Cloud for that. Uh, we're also looking at things like um, a behavior, you know, the type of behavior. So if you're actually putting out your service into the cloud and it's being hosted out in the cloud, and we're seeing uh, access from, from third parties, from, from end users that are outside where you would normally serve. If you're a European-focused organization and you're starting to see connections coming from outside Europe, maybe Asia, and you're starting to see data access that shouldn't be there. So again, how can we block that or report on that? So these are the types of things that are being integrated into the cloud solutions that we're providing under Umbrella. And the final point is, um, you know, if you're looking at the ways of working and the change there, we've got to think about what can we do at the end device level. We've got to allow you, us, uh, to be able to work from anywhere and be potentially off, you know, the dedicated enterprise network. So this is where we make sure that the user, whether they're connecting to the internet on-prem, off-prem, they're still going through the umbrella service. They're still having uh, the resolution of that service for umbrella so we can start doing the blocking and protection. So next slide, please. So from a perspective of that, it, we really look at this in, in kind of different areas we can protect, whether you're in the HQ, whether you're in the branch, whether you're roaming. And that can be a smart device, uh, like a mobile phone, that can be a laptop type device. So again, from our perspective, we because we're resolving that first point of connection to the internet, so a very simple mechanism to do that, DNS. So every time you access a, a domain, you're using DNS to do that resolution. We're the, we act as that, that first line resolver. And that means that we can start using the intelligence that Sean's been talking to. We can start u using that to, to help block uh, the harmful sites that potentially your users or may be going to. So this is something that we've been doing for several years. Um, since 2006, it's been completely 100% uptime with this service. It helps consumers, enterprise, and SPs in regards to what we're doing here. So next slide, please. From a point of view of kind of how, how do we evolve these models and capabilities that we've got. So first of all, the, the key is data. From Cisco perspective, 175 billion requests uh, that we're resolving uh, a, a day. That's, you know, 4 to 5% of the internet. That gives us a lot to go on around what we can look at. So that helps us really from that perspective. We've got the threat research organization, 100 plus uh, strong. That's the largest private uh, threat research organization globally. Uh, and Charm and the team are, are part of that, that wider organization uh, from a research perspective. And we do, we're using a lot of modeling uh, that, that helps us actually make decisions dynamically within, within the tool set. So it isn't all human-based. It's basically dynamic uh, machine learning AI-based models as well that we're using up front. So we're using the mixture of, of the two of those to, to, to help. And, you know, again, Sean was talking to that. Next slide, please. And just talking more widely, I'm sure many of you on the call are using either third-party um, non-Cisco uh, security solutions as well as Cisco security solutions. So really, Cisco have, have uh, a balanced view on this. So 
we can take threat intel feeds, we can take information from other third parties uh, through APIs into solutions like Umbrella, but also we can uh, take a lot of threat intel from, of course, our own solutions that you may have one or several of across the estate, and that could be across both network, endpoint, and cloud. So we take that threat intel and we combine that together so that we can actually act on that and we can be predictive and we can be proactive in, in blocking across one or several of these points of access. Because we totally understand that, you know, in some cases you may be off the physical corporate network, um, but, you know, you're using an endpoint, you could be accessing the cloud. So you could be at any point in the cycle of the day interacting in each of these kind of points of, of contact. So again, all of our security capabilities come back into uh, Talos as a threat intel uh, capability. It's not something that you buy. You don't go and say, can I have Talos as a threat intel organization? It's something that's naturally there when you buy one or several of these solutions and capabilities from Cisco. Next slide, please. So really kind of coming down to it is how do you get advantages of, of what you know, intelligence we get from teams like Charm? The way that works in the cloud-delivered cloud manner is with Umbrella as a platform, it's cloud, it's SaaS-delivered. So it means we can be very quick at integrating uh, new classifiers and new categories with, within that tool set. So crypto mining was one that we saw and discussed a little bit earlier on in, in this presentation today. And as a, as a one simple example, that was something that we added into uh, the SaaS-delivered solution very quickly. Uh, we roll it out in stages so customers can trial it as early trial customers and then we can put it as a fully fledged capability. So if you look at this at the moment, you know, some of the, the quite key facts around this is, is one in three of our customers are already seeing, uh, you know, crypto mining activity. And by turning on this, this can be something that blocks it straight away. So you can really start seeing value, uh, you know, at first point of contact with, with these types of solution. And you'll see more and more of these trends that we're talking about, about how we put additional protection points and roll those out in Umbrella very quickly, and you get that advantage of, of this as a solution to help block against those, those threats. Um, next slide, please. And one thing I just wanted to call out here, this is a bit of uh, kind of humor as well in regards to how you may want to look at your security or not. So, so this was an example of uh, some, some crypto mining action. Uh, something quite recent that I saw in, in the news, so this Chinese headmaster fired over secret, secret uh, coin mining at school. So this is a real-life example. I bet if you look left and right and you talk to your colleagues about crypto mining, I, every day I have these conversations and people are talking about you know, their own use cases of doing it or where they've seen it, or maybe not even aware of it until they start putting in tool sets like Umbrella. Uh, and if you just click one, one more through, uh, Sean. The thing in this case, and what we're trying to, to indicate here, is in this case they became suspicious because of the whirring noise that continued day and night uh, around uh, this infrastructure. But in reality, security isn't that straightforward. You know, you're not going to be able to listen out for that whirring noise of, you know, use of crypto mining estate. But the way you're going to find it is by intelligent tools like Umbrella and actually being able to look at that data within your infrastructure. So think about that, that point when, when you kind of move forward from today's session about crypto mining being one of several of those trends that we're trying to look out for and we're developing capabilities for to block against. Next slide, please. So simplest way to, to have a look at this. So we can do a proof of value with year round platforms like Umbrella, cloud-based, um, so you can gain access to it very quickly. You can po point your DNS uh, yeah, to us very quickly. We, we do something called Anycast, so two IPs that we globally advertise, highly available, uh, as I was discussing before. And there's two ways we can do this. We can get this pointed to us very quickly with, within you know, the hour, once you want to turn on the service. And we can either do a reporting mode around this, so we can report back to, to you what threats uh, we would have blocked against and what we're seeing in your state, or we can actually turn on some of those categories and start blocking from the start of the trial. Depends on your comfort level, and we can, you know, work through that with you on an individual basis. Um, and if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll just talk to what, what you actually get out of the trial as well. So from a free trial perspective, uh, what you actually get at the end of it is a security report. It's a very visual report that can talk to uh, what the threats we're seeing, you know, malware, phishing, 
uh, crypto mining, etc., you can get a real-time uh, report on exactly what's been picked up. And typically within an organization, within days, we'll see uh, outputs, you know, typically we'll see a, you know, a week to two week process around this. So you've got a good cross-section of, of time uh, and data around uh, that, that traffic that's going out to the internet and what different users are doing. We can actually help pinpoint as well, depending on how you set up the proof of value, we can actually pinpoint down to, to device users uh, if you want to get to that level of granularity. But as a mainstream, it's very straightforward to do this. And this is a free report that you will get uh, that gives you uh, a viewpoint of, of what we're seeing in your estate. So again, so just coming back to some closing points on, on the next slide, you know, have a think about that. If you want to, uh, you know, do a proof of value around this, uh, you'll be given a, uh, a link at the end and sent out with the recording and the slides about how to approach that. Um, have a look at also the security report that we published in 2018 uh, and some of the additional links about what we're seeing as we move into 2019. You know, Cisco as an organization is very much evolving, developing, and investing very heavily in security, so you'll see more coming as we go into 2019, but we're really about, you know, securing and protecting our customers and, and partners uh, with very much what we do. So. Um, I'll pause there and then we'll come back to see if there's any wider Q&A either in the chat panel or things that may have come up uh, from Haz or Fernando that uh, have been called out for myself and Sean. Great, thanks Paul. On the chat it's been uh, all answered so far, all good, so nothing to call out. Um, I guess we can wait a few more minutes in case any questions do come up, in which case we can assist on the chat. Um, or if anyone wants anything specifically to be called out, then we're happy to support that as well. So, Sean, has, has there any additional points that you want to call out uh, from your perspective? Oh, uh, yep. So, just, just for uh, the so you covered about the domain perspective and the IP perspective. So, so if you if you want me to just show you something really quick, I can actually show them. So, so just giving you a example of things that we we've done so far. But if we could just see here, uh, so this we we do a little bit of intelligence like this too, uh, where this domain was actually blocked by Umbrella 27 days before the attack actually happened. Because this was the base attack, and then we blocked this domain. This is basically a ransomware a dropping domain. We have an algorithm that generates DGA exactly like this on various permutations and combinations, say like 53, CK, 52, 3P, and the various combinations. And we put it in the block list. So even before the campaign fully grows, we block it. And that's one thing that we would want to show you. And we have a thread grid integration so that if you click on the samples, you can tell that what sort of a sample it is, uh, who dropped it, where it came from, is it a ransomware or not. So it gives you those details to saying that this is a generic ransomware that we've uh, detected for this. Uh, adding to that, once we block the top domain, all the other domains under this, it's blocked. And if we figure out that the IP address is really bad, then the IP address is going to come and then we're going to block that IP too. So if the IP is bad, all the domains under that IP. So this is called as bulletproof hosting at times, that uh, when an IP address actually hosts uh, without you know any, any, any filters, like anybody can host anything, we call it as bulletproof because the service provider does not check the content that's hosted. So in that case, is blocking all the domains is difficult. We just block that IP and call it as bulletproof hosting. Uh, and then we also do a predictive spacing, that is, if this domain is visited and there are a couple of other domains that are visited before and after, then we're going to block both the domains because we feel that all the three domains are connected in such a way. So these are the various other intelligences that we have. And then we have the last but not the least, I'll actually show you something, where we block pattern-based, the trending stuff. So this is actually a Black Friday phishing page. We have uh, classifiers and intelligence and patterns that we have. The moment we see something like Black Friday or invoice or reports, and then it does not have any relation to the domain, we block the URL and the domain. So these are the various type of intelligence that covers all your bases. 
and all the logic that we are building and the intelligence goes to your DNS and if you point your DNS towards umbrella, you protect it towards all the attacks, similar attacks and the emerging attacks. So, so that's what I actually want to add. Intentional. Yep. Okay, if there's um, no other questions today, appreciate uh, your time uh, today. Uh, we'll, we're doing a series of these webinars, so feel free to, to join future webinars as well that we'll be doing in this particular area. Uh, our contact details are there, so if there's any follow-up questions that you might want to direct to us, uh, either myself or Sean, then please feel free to do that. Uh, but look forward to working with you moving forward and seeing you on other webinars. So uh, thank you very much for your time.